In this example, we will cover the basics of setting up an internal flow problem using Hyperworks CFD. We will first switch over to our geometry tools, which are all of the tools that we can use to clean up and modify our model. Within these tools, we have the validate tool, which allows us to do a series of surface and solid checks on our model to identify any problems. If we click on surface checks, what we'll get is a list of different checks that we can conduct on our model to identify problems such as free edges or sliver surfaces. If we click on free edges, this will bring up the tool that allows us to clean up any free edges within our model. This tool has different options and different methods that we can use, but for now we'll start by using the stitch all method. After clicking this, you'll notice that some of the red edges will disappear. However, some of the other red edges to the left will not disappear. And that is because of our stitch tolerance. To fix this, we need to increase our stitch tolerance to a value that will allow us to capture the proximity of those two edges, but not so much that it will capture other edges that are unwanted. After clicking this button, you'll notice that most of the red edges on the left have been cleared, with the exception of a few circular red edges. To clear these, we're going to use a different method. Within the same free edges tool, you'll notice that there are multiple different methods of cleaning up, such as patch gap, patch hole, or delete, in which case we will be using patch hole. When we use patch hole, you'll notice that we can grab either of the holes in here and simply click on the edge to close that hole. We can repeat this for the other holes as well. We can also use this patch hole on surfaces that are not perfectly circular, such as this small gap here. With that done, we can now see that on the left, the list of errors has changed a little bit. We have no free edges, but we do have a closed shell, as well as a couple of slivers. If we click on closed shells, what this tool will allow us to do is generate a solid volume out of the enclosed surfaces. To do this, we can just click on create all, which will automatically find any enclosed surfaces to generate our volume. We will know that this is a solid geometry because of two things. We can either check on the parts browser on the left and see a cube next to the name of our part. Or we can also notice that the edges are actually thicker now. The last thing to repair would be the two sliver surfaces, which are detected here. Sliver surfaces are very small surfaces that may cause problems with meshing later down the line. To repair these, we simply suppress any edges that might cause a problem. If we simply click on the surface itself, it will automatically suppress one of the two edges to try to keep it as connected as possible. We can click the second edge in the same way, and this will easily repair the two sliver surfaces that appeared. With that done, we have all of our surface repairs taken care of, which means that now we can do one more validation of our model to make sure there are no other problems. To do this, we click on validate once more. And if everything is cleared out, like it is here, you should notice a blue check mark on the top. Now that we've created our solid geometry, the next step would be to create our fluid geometry. To do this, we can use the plug tool which is an automated tool that can identify internal surfaces and create a volume based off of those wetted surfaces. 
We can first create the volume by selecting the bounding surfaces, which are these outer surfaces that would tell the software where the limits of the fluid would be. And then we select an internal cavity surface. So if I click any of these surfaces inside, you'll see that all of the surfaces will be highlighted in red. This is identifying all of the wetted surfaces. Now that I've identified the wetted surfaces, I can click on any of these red surfaces to automatically generate the fluid domain, which is shown here. Now that we have our fluid domain, we can then focus on validating our model once more to make sure that we have this blue check mark, which denotes that there is no problems with our geometry currently. With this geometry, since we are only working with the fluid itself, we do not need the solid geometry anymore. So I can simply delete it by right clicking and selecting delete. This will delete the solid geometry. You'll notice that every time we make a change to our model, whether that's deleting a solid or editing any part of our geometry, the blue check mark that we originally had will disappear, which means that we need to validate it once more to verify those changes. You'll see that now we have the blue check mark once more. Now that we've cleaned up our geometry, the next step would be to start specifying our boundary conditions and specifying all of our physics. To do this, we would move up to the flow tab, which will bring up all of the tools that we'll use in order to specify our boundary conditions, as well as all of the physics for the solver. The general workflow for this tool is moving from left to right, which means that we will start off from physics and work our way to the right through all of the boundary conditions. So the first step would be clicking on physics, which will allow us to specify all of the physics for the solver. Things like specifying if we want a steady state or a transient solution, as well as any kind of turbulence model that we support. In this case, we will be running a steady state simulation using the Spallard Almaris turbulence model. From there, the next thing we can do is we can adjust different types of solver controls, such as the update factor, also known as the relaxation factor, as well as the maximum number of steps. In this case, we will use the default parameters for both of these parameters. We will now close this window and move on to the next thing, which would be our material library. Our material library supports all sorts of different standard models that we have stored already, but we also have the ability of creating our own material models. If we click on my materials, I can then click on the plus sign located here which will bring up the window that allows us to create our own custom materials. In here, we can adjust different parameters, such as having a ideal gas law for our density or having a power law for non-Antonian fluids within the viscosity options. There's also the ability to select from a constant density, as well as using piecewise linear to specify a varying density based off of two axes. For now, we'll just use one of the standard values that are currently stored within the software. To assign the material, we click on the material button here, and we specify which solid we want to attach this material property to. So if I click on this green solid right here, You'll see that this window pops up, which allows me to select from all of the different stored values that I have within my table. I can just select air for this case. And from now on, I can start confirming my different selections in two different ways. You'll see that I have this green check mark as well as this black triangle. The difference between the two being that if I select the black triangle, it'll confirm and keep me within the tool while the green check mark will confirm and close the tool. Now that we've assigned our material properties, the next step would be to start assigning our boundary conditions. In here, you'll see that we have a variety of different boundary conditions that we can use. However, all we'll be using right now would be our profiled inlet condition and our regular outlet boundary condition. So let's start by clicking on profiled, which will point us to start selecting some surfaces, as you can see here. 
In this case, we need to start selecting our inlet surfaces. So I can simply just click on all four of these surfaces here to specify our inlet. And you'll see that we're pointed to specify the average velocity for these inlets, which will I, I will assign as 1.5 for this example. Once we've done that, as I just mentioned, we have the ability to confirm the selection by clicking the black triangle or the check mark. In this case, we're going to click the check mark since we're switching to a different tool. So I'll now click on the outlet boundary condition. Once I click on the outlet boundary condition, I can just simply click on the outlet surface here and confirm my selection. You'll now notice that I have a one on top of both of these dictating that I have one or one boundary condition set assigned to multiple surfaces in this case, as well as one outlet boundary condition assigned to this one surface over here. If I want to edit or make any changes to these boundary conditions, I can click on any of the boundary condition icons, which will bring up the list of all of the boundary conditions I've assigned so far. In here, I can right click and edit any of these, whether it's the selection of the different surfaces or adding more surfaces, or I can also select the different colors or assign different uh, surfaces to different boundary conditions as well. In this case, let's change the color so that we can identify which of the surfaces are actually the inlet boundary condition. We can also rename our boundary conditions here, which is important in this case because using AccuSolve, some of these names will actually be referenced in our solution when we start post-processing our results. So it's important to keep clear names on all of your boundary conditions so you can identify them in the post-processing phase. After assigning our inlet and our outlet, you might notice that there's also this default wall boundary condition. All of the surfaces by default are placed in this wall boundary condition. As you start assigning different boundary conditions, you'll notice that those same walls will get assigned to different collectors here, which means that you can only assign one surface to one boundary condition. Now that we've assigned all of our boundary conditions, the next step would be to begin our meshing process. To do this, we jump over to our meshing tab, which again will now have all of the different tools that we'll be using to generate our mesh. For starters, we can start with our surface meshing. To use this, I simply click on surface mesh and then select all of the surfaces that I would want to be controlled by this mesh control. So I simply select all of the surfaces in my model for now and assign the desired mesh parameters for this. You will see that there are some dots here to kind of give you an idea as to the spacing between the different nodes at the current size. This can be used as a reference to make sure you can gauge whether your mesh is too fine or too coarse early on. In this case, we will keep it at 0.01 and we will click the check mark. At this point, you'll notice that there hasn't been any meshing done so far. The reason for that is because we're currently assigning all of our mesh controls first, and then we do a batch mesh process where we mesh all of those surfaces at once. So once we've selected our surface meshing, the next thing to do would be to assign our boundary layer meshes. In this case, we're going to select our boundary layer mesh first, and then we will select all of the surfaces that will be assigned to this model. So in this case, we will click on all of these surfaces here, and we will deselect the surfaces that will not have any kind of boundary layer assigned to them. In this example, the surfaces that will not have a boundary layer will be our inlets and outlets. So we will deselect by holding shift and then clicking on the surfaces that we do not want. Once we've deselected all of those surfaces, you'll notice this window here, which lets us specify our parameters. Some general rules of thumb that we'll be using for this, we will be specifying a first layer thickness of one order of magnitude smaller than our surface mesh. So it will be 0.001. And in this case, we're going to assign six layers. 
and we'll keep our growth method as constant to keep the model simple. Once we specified all of these parameters, we simply click the, ch the check mark once more, and we can move on to the next step, which would be the volume mesh parameters. So if I click on volume mesh, I will now select the solid geometry that I want to assign this to. And in this case, we can keep roughly a similar size as our surface mesh. So we can do 0 0.01 for our volume mesh as well. Once we've specified all of the parameters that we want, we can click the check mark here, and we can begin the meshing process. For this, we have a couple of different options. We can either select the surface here to only generate our surface mesh, or we can click on volume here in order to generate both the surface mesh and the volume mesh. I'll click on volume now so that we can generate both of them together. Now you'll see that we have some meshing parameters here. Now these parameters would be considered global parameters that apply to our entire model. However, since we've created local parameters, these take priority over the global parameters. So let's begin the meshing process by clicking mesh. Once the meshing is complete, you'll see a green check mark in this window that pops up, which keeps track of all of your meshing attempts as well as your solution attempts. If there were any kind of issues, you will normally see a red X here, which you can then inspect by right clicking and viewing the log file. Once all of this is complete, we can close both of these windows. And as soon as we close our window, you'll be able to see the mesh that you generated. And here we can see everything from the different boundary layers that we created, as well as the volume mesh and the surface mesh that we assigned. With this done, we can then finally move into the solution step. You'll notice that it automatically jumps to the solution tab since it knows you're ready to begin processing your solution. And here we have all sorts of different monitors which allow you to keep track of different parameters or different regions in your model that may not have some kind of boundary condition or any kind of point that might be of importance. In this case though, we can move directly into the run tab. In this window, we can specify all of our run parameters. So we can specify, for example, the name of our model as well as the run directory. And if we want to have a serial or multi-process run, and then simply specify the number of cores that you would want to run your model with. In this case, we're going to be using four, which means that from here, we can just click run and wait for our solution to complete. And here you'll see that this window pops up again. This time though, it's noting that we have an AccuSolve run and it will show us the current process. While this is solving, we can monitor the, our run by right-clicking on this and clicking View Log File once more. Once the run is complete, we will see a green check mark appear on the row that specifies AccuSolve. This means that the solver was able to finish without any issues which concludes the process of setting up and running an internal flow problem using HyperWorks CFD.